भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय नम भगवते वासुदेवाय Srimad Bhagavatam canto 1 chapter 5 Narada's instructions on Srimad Bhagavatam text number 11 one of the very important verses of the Bhagavatam the dvad visardo so the word meanings tut that vak vocabulary visarga creation janata the people in general agha sin viplava revolutionary yasmin in which prati shlokam each and every stanza abhadhavati irregularly composed api in spite of namani transcendental names etc anantasya of the unlimited lord yashaha glories ankitani depicted yet what shrinvanti do hear gayanti do sing grinanti do accept sadava the purified men who are honest tadva visardo janata ga viplavo यस्मिन् प्रति श्लोकम अभद्धवत्यपि नामान्यनंतस्य यशोंकितानिया हिन्वन्ति गायन्ति गृणन्ति साधव Vagvisargo janataga viplavo Vagvisargo janataga viplavo Yasmin prati shlokam abhadhavatyapi Yasmin prati shlokam abhadhavatyapi Namanyanantasya yashonkitaniya Vinvanti gayanti grinanti sadava Tadvagvi sardo janata ga viplavo Yasmin prati shlokam abhadhavatyapi नामान्यनंतस्यशोंकितानियत्नामान्यनंतस्यशोंकितानियत्वन्ति गायन्ति गृणन्ति साधव Yes. 
Translation. On the other hand, that literature which is full of descriptions of the transcendental glories of the name, fame, form, pastimes, etc., of the unlimited Supreme Lord is a different creation, full of transcendental words directed toward bringing about a revolution in the impious lives of this world's misdirected civilization. Such transcendental literatures, even though imperfectly composed, are heard, sung, and accepted by purified men who are thoroughly honest. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Miritam Mena Tasmai Shri Gurudevina Maha So I'm going to comment this as I go through it, the purport. I wanted to mention a few things before I start reading the purport. This verse, as well as the previous one, about the place of pilgrimage for crows, that kind of literature. And the next one, Naishkarmiyam Apyachuta Bhava Varjutam, which says basically that jnana is not beautiful if there's no bhakti. So these three verses come up in the 12th canto in the same order. The next to the last chapter, the 12th chapter, the 12th canto, is called Topics, I think, Topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the last, the last, the 13th chapter of the 12th canto is called The Glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. So in that chapter, on the topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam, these verses come up. And I just want to read the verses leading up to it. They're very nice. Three verses. This is text 48, 49, and 50 of 12th chapter of the 12th canto. One may not be satisfied, oh, excuse me, that's a purport. When, uh, this is a translation. When people properly glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead or simply hear about His power, the Lord personally enters their hearts and cleanses away every trace of misfortune, just as the sun removes the darkness or as a powerful wind drives away the clouds. Words that do not describe the transcendental personality of Godhead, but instead deal with temporary matters, are simply false and useless. Only those words that manifest the transcendental qualities of the Supreme Lord are actually truthful, auspicious, and pious. Those words describing the glories of the all-famous personality of Godhead are attractive, reliable, excuse me, relishable, and ever fresh. Indeed, such words are a per perpetual festival for the mind, and they dry up the ocean of misery. So there are some um, many important phrases in this verse. I was going to read also, this is a little something from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Uh, the first is from his commentary on this verse, and the second is from the previous verse. I've just taken a couple of extracts in his commentary. So he says, the word vacha, that's from this, this verse, means statements, what is spoken. Therefore, statements like the following would appear to make the Bhagavatam a place for crows. So he's going to quote something. He's going to say, he says, that because in the previous verse, it's talking about mundane topics are like places of pilgrimage for crows. So he's saying, so he's going to quote something. He's going to say, this may seem to be in the same kind of category. So this is what he quotes. This is from the ninth canto. 
The brothers gave their youngest learned brother, Nabhaga, their father, Nabhaga, as his share of the property when he returned from Brahmachari life. So this is one of those stories in the Bhagavad This is again from the ninth canto, which has some interesting stories. So in the course of a, one genealogy, these, the father and son, uh, Nabhaga is the, is the son and Nabhaga is the father. So the story goes that the, this Nabhaga, he went off to the ashram, the guru, and he spent a long time there. So his father was retiring, and when this, this Nabhaga came home, he asked his brothers, well, what did I get it as, as an inheritance? They took all the property and the money and so on. So he said, what, do I, what did I get as an inheritance? And they said, oh, your inheritance is our father. <laughs> so he went to the father and he said, Father, I, uh, uh, you're my inheritance. My brothers told me you're my inheritance. And he said, don't listen to those rascals. I'm not your inheritance. <laughs> and then he told him, he said, you go to this sacrifice. There are these brahmanas from some lineage. I forget. It was Bhargava, maybe Brigu. Anyway, so you go to them. They're performing a sacrifice and you'll get everything you want as a result of that sacrifice. So he went there and then what happened was someone else showed up. He said, Duh, those are mine. Whatever is being offered in this sacrifice, that's for me. So the, the Nabhaga was bewildered by it, and uh, I forget how it unfolds. Maybe his father told him. Actually, the person who arrived on the scene was Lord Shiva. And uh, his father said, yes, actually, it does belong to him. The father, was the, uh, all these things were offered to him. So this is what Vishwanath Chakravarti is, is referring to, is maybe this kind of subject is a place of pilgrims for crows, just like the last, what was mentioned in the last verse. So he says, and it may be argued that none of the Puranas written by Vyas should be considered as a place of crows. So what, why is the Bhagavatam so special? Since nothing there is completely devoid of the glories of the Lord. So in other words, what's implied is that everything before the Bhagavatam is a place of pilgrimage for crows. Just like we were hearing, you know, Vyasadeva. He's, uh, or Narada is telling him that what you've done, it's all condemned, it's all bad, everything that you did before, before the Bhagavatam, which is coming up. So this is, so then this verse is quoted to satisfy it. It says, Narayana, the soul of the universal form, this is from the 12th canto, who annihilates the accumulated sins of the Kali age is not much glorified in other works. But, the, but Bhagavan, with unlimited forms, is abundantly and constantly described throughout the various nation, uh, narrations of this Srimad Bhagavatam. And then Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, taking this verse and the next verse, which I haven't quoted here, in the Bhagavatam into consideration, the word Bhachaha should mean the general import of the discussion rather than each sentence. That being the case, the chapters and stories of Bhagavatam are, are all ornaments to the glories of the Lord. In other Puranas, however, many of the stories are devoid of the glories of the Lord and are therefore the place of crows. Thus, there is no contradiction. So a couple of other things. Uh, one of the phrases here is a prati shlokam. What is it? Yasmin prati shlokam abadhavat yapi. Well, I'm on the wrong page, that's why I can't what see it. What's the last sentence you read? What's that? What's the last sentence you read? It's from Vishwanath. What does it say again? Oh, you want me to hear what it says again? In other Puranas, however, many of the stories are devoid of the glories of the Lord and are therefore the place of the crows. Thus, there is no contradiction. No contradiction. In other words, between, say, here he's saying that this is not a place of pilgrimage. The Bhagavatam is not a place of pilgrimage for crows like some of the other, like the other Puranas are. Even though there are stories like the one that I just told about Nabhaga and, and his brothers. Because he's saying the general sense of the, the, what does he say, the general import of the discussion. So that's why it said that the Bhagavatam, like Lord Chaitanya said, there's prema in every syllable of the Srimad Bhagavatam because of this overall consideration. It's all, ultimately it's meant for glorifying Krishna. So here there's this phrase, yasmin, yasmin prati shlokam abadhavat api. So even though, or there, therein, prati shlokam means 
every shloka, verse after verse, basically, verse after verse, even though verse after verse, is abadha bhakti, abadha bhakti. So if you look at the root of this, it seems, this is a bit of speculation on my part, but it seems pretty obvious that badha, badha means bound or controlled. So you can say that the best prose or poetry is, is bound by certain rules. Uh, the uh, Krishna is glorified as uttapa shloka, so generally, you know, just like the Bhagavatam itself, of course. So, but it, but it says here, even though somebody writes something, where, where all of it is abadha, vat, vat, vat means possessing. So possessing the character, you could say, of being unbound, unbound by rules. This is usually considered not a very good thing. Well, maybe in modern writing it might be, but in that, at least in this context. So even though it's like that, uh, well, how did, oh, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, he, Prabhupada translates it as um, irregularly composed. And Vishwana translates it as sparse ornaments in the verses. <laughs> this is what he thinks is a fault because it doesn't have nice ornamentation, like beautiful you know, writing. And uh, Sridhar Swami translates it as ungrammatical language. So the point here is that even though the language is not perfect, because it's glorifying Krishna, then, then of course, so the honest devotees sing it. That's the last line. Shrinvanti gayanti grinanti sadhava. So the sadhavas, which Prabhupada translates as the purified men who are thoroughly honest, because sadhu, it has this sense to it. So the sadhus, or the devotees, really it means the devotees, they accept those works. This is a general uh, explanation, basically. It's not only it's saying, in general, anything that glorifies. There's a nice, Prabhupada gave a lecture on this verse in Montreal in the early days. And he mentions, he said, just like the, the author of writing who's glorifying the Lord, he may not be expert in prosody, he said, writing prose or poetry, but he says what, what we have to see is the heart of the man, the heart of what he is saying. That's what's important. So that's the idea here. Anything that glorifies Krishna, then the, the honest people, honest devotees, they accept it. And these three words are used here, shrinvanti, gayanti, and grinanti. So shrinvanti means to hear, gayanti means to chant, and grinanti means to accept. So Vishwanath apparently seeing that, well, to hear and accept, it kind of seems to be the same thing. So he says, uh, let's see, where, did, where is that? Oh, anyway, he, excuse me. He says, he says that it's repeated, this same idea, Grinanti is pretty much Srinbanti. He says, because the devotees hear, and then they chant, but because they're not uh, satiated, they hear again. So they do it repeatedly. They hear, chant, hear, chant, hear, chant. He said, this is the idea that because they're not, they're not satiated. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so now I'll bring in the purport. Now what you'll see is that Prabhupada begins his purport with the last line of the verse, basically, is what he's talking about here. Because it says they will accept. So Prabhupada is, is, is uh, using this, this idea there, they will accept. The devotees will accept, or the honest persons will accept these even imperfectly composed verses. So Prabhupada says, It is a qualification of the great thinkers to pick up the best even from the worst. It is said that the intelligent man should pick up nectar from a stock of poison, should accept gold even from a filthy place, should accept a good and qualified wife even from an obscure family, and should accept a good lesson even from a man or from a teacher who comes from the untouchables. These are some of the ethical instructions for everyone in every place without exception. But a saint is far above the level of ordinary man. So the saint applies the same principle, but he's in a, even in a different category. He is always absorbed in glorifying the Supreme Lord because of broadcasting the holy name and fame of the Supreme Lord did I skip a sentence? Yeah. I skipped a sentence, huh? He is always absorbed in glorifying the Supreme Lord because by broadcasting the holy name and fame of the Supreme Lord, the polluted atmosphere of the world will change. And as a result of propagating the transcendental literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam, 
people will become sane in their transactions. So now this interesting Prabhupada. Now Prabhupada is writing this in 1962. As you'll see, I'm going to read something. He said, while preparing this commentary on this particular stanza of Srimad Bhagavatam, we have a crisis before us. Our neighboring friend China has attacked the border of India with a militaristic spirit. We have practically no business in the political field. Oh, actually, before I read that, so I'm going to, the prophet said, India, China has attacked India. So I looked it up in, in Wiki Purana, Wik, Wiki, Wikipedia, what that was all about. Just a couple of paragraphs there, you might find this interesting. Short paragraphs. The Sino-Indian War, also known as the Indo-China War, and the Sino-Indian border conflict was a war between China and India that occurred in 1962. A disputed Himalayan border was the main pretext for the war, but other issues played a role. There had been a series of violent border incidents after the 1959 Tibetan uprising, when India had granted asylum to the Dalai Lama. India initiated a for forward policy in which it placed outposts along the border, including several north of the McMahon Line, the eastern portion of the line of actual control proclaimed by Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai in 1959. So there was a dispute of where the border line was drawn. Unable to reach political accommodation on disputed territory along the 2,000 mile long Himalayan border, the Chinese launched simultaneous offensive in, offensives in Ladakh across the McMahon Line on 20 October 1962. Chinese troops advanced over Indian forces in both theaters, capturing Raizong La in Cheshu in the Western Theater as well as Tawang in the Eastern Theater. The war ended when China declared a ceasefire on November 20th, 1962, and simultaneously announced its withdrawal to its claimed line of actual control. So that's what Prophet is referring to here, that incident. Our neighboring friend China has attacked the border of India with a militaristic spirit. We have practically no business in the political field, yet we see that previously there were both China and India and they both lived peacefully, excuse me, for centuries without ill feeling. The reason is that they lived the, those days in an atmosphere of God consciousness, and every country over the surface of the world was God-fearing, pure-hearted, and simple, and there was no question of political diplomacy. So I read this, I was like, what? <laughs> when was it ever like that? So I, I actually went to the original, Prabhupada's original Bhagavatam, and he uses the word something like old times or something like that. I forget. He has the word old in there, which it was taken out in, the, in this. So that, to me, that makes a big difference. Because when I read this, I was thinking probably was talking about fairly recent centuries. But it seems that probably not talking about that. Because China and India both existed, maybe not, not as nation states, but it's for a very, very long time. Going back, you know, China has a very long history and India has a very long history. So it seems that the prophet is talking about those times way back then, 5,000 years ago and before that. That's when people were living in an atmosphere of God consciousness. Now, I don't know what kind of God consciousness there was there in China, but most places of the world had some kind of religion, some concept of spirituality. Now, of course, it's atheistic state. So Prabhupada continues, there is no cause of quarrel between the two countries, China and India, over land which is not very suitable for habitation. Actually, I was reading more about this war. They were fighting at something like, I forget the, the height of it, really, really high up there. You know, 15, 10, 15,000 feet, 20,000 feet up in the Himalayas, in the snow. And <laughs> it's just, who wants to live there? Of course, I suppose some people do, but... Of course, it's not about that, obviously. They're fighting for some strategic reason or just because they're proud, whatever. Uh, and certainly there's no cause for fighting on this issue. But due to the age of quarrel, Kali, which we have discussed, there is always a chance of quarrel and slight provocation. This is due not to the issue in question, 
but to the polluted atmosphere of this age. Now this next sentence, well here, systematically there is propagation by a section of people to stop glorification of the name and fame of the Supreme Lord. Now this is in italics. In the original Bhagavatam, it's in bold. Prabhupada would emphasize things with bold rather than italic. So this phrase has always stuck in my mind. There's systematic, systematically there is propaganda by a section of people to stop glorification of the name and fame of the Supreme Lord. So I was thinking, just like we have the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, they basically have the International Society for Non-Krishna Consciousness, against Krishna Consciousness. Systematic propaganda. There are, of course today, also because it's the age of Kali, the demons are in control, they have the power, and they are directly against, they want to stop. Of course, that's what it was like, in, 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 of course that's how it is in China now, as I was saying, but in Russia during the, uh, the Soviet Union, that the official position of the state was atheism. Basically, religion was outlawed. We know what happened to the devotees during those times, but the horrible things they went through. So, systematic propagation. They're preaching. They're trying to convince people that there's no God. And, of course, this goes on in so many ways also. Scientific materialism and Darwinism and so on, which they may not admit it, but in so many ways it's steering people towards atheism. So Prabhupada said, this is, there's a plan behind this, in other words. They're doing this on purpose. They're trying to stop the glorification of God. And what's the result? And conflict over, just, just in principle, basically. Because it's the age of Kali, people are fighting, everyone, there's nothing to fight about. And especially countries are fighting over insignificant things. So what's the solution? That, so this is, you can hear, this is, if you remember the preface to the Bhagavatam, this is echoing a lot of the same, the same ideas. The Bhagavatam is necessary for this, to combat this. So he says, therefore there is a great need for disseminating the message of Srimad Bhagavatam all over the world. It is the duty of every responsible Indian to broadcast the transcendental message of Srimad Bhagavatam throughout the world to do all the to do all the supermost good as well as to bring about the desired peace in the world because india has failed in her duty by neglecting this responsible work there is so much quarrel and trouble all over the world the Prabhupada's is laying blame at the uh, feet of india i found it interesting that Prabhupada is, is addressing india and indians here even though he's of course he's writing the bhagavatam because he wants to preach to the english speaking world of course, India had educated English-speaking Indians there. But um, Prabhupada would always promote this idea. And there's a quote, you know, in that in Prabhupada's first, I think, first issue of BTG, and during the war, he quotes different people. I mentioned before how he quotes someone saying, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury that our resolve must be back to God. It seems to be where Prabhupada get the back to Godhead, or name for his magazine. But someone else he quotes there, who says something like, we must turn to India for the very home of religion, or the very home of spirituality. I think, I think he says religion. We must turn to India, the very home of religion, for a solution. So Prabhupada would often say that all over the world, people look to India for spiritual guidance. So he's saying, but we, what have we done? We've, we've been chasing the West instead of, instead of giving them spiritual guidance. We are confident that if the transcendental message of Srimad Bhagavatam is received only by the leading men of the world, certainly there will be a change of heart, and naturally the people in general will follow them. The Prophet always wanted to preach to the leaders and influence them. The mass of people in general, are tools in the hands of the modern politicians and leaders of the world. If there is a change of heart of the leaders only, certainly there will be a radical change in the atmosphere of the world. We know that our honest attempt to present this great literature cover, conveying transcendental messages for reviving the God consciousness of the people in general and re-spiritualizing the world atmosphere Quite an ambitious project for one man. He's not an ordinary man. I'm going to re-spiritualize the whole world. Will be, uh, it's fraught with many difficulties. 
Our presenting this matter in adequate language, especially a foreign language, will certainly fail. And there will be so many literary discrepancies despite our honest attempt to present it in the proper way. This whole purport is just so masterfully done. It's just amazing. But we are sure that with all our faults in this connection, the seriousness of the subject matter will be taken into consideration. And the leaders of society will still accept this due to its being an honest attempt to glorify the Almighty God. When there is fire in a house, the inmates of the house go out to get help from the neighbors who may be foreigners. And yet without knowing the language, the victims of the fire express themselves and the neighbors understand the need even though not expressed in the same language. The same spirit of cooperation is needed to broadcast this transcendental message of the Srimad Bhagavatam throughout the polluted atmosphere of the world. After all, it is a technical science of spiritual values, and thus we are concerned with the techniques and not with the language. If the teachings of this great literature are understood by the people of the world, there will be success. This idea of the, in the spirit of cooperation is needed. We can remember how Srila Prabhupada would often thank us, his disciples, for cooperating with him, for helping him. And I'm just one old man, and you know, how can I do this? But you've come. Actually, one time he said, my Guru Maharaj just sent you all to assist me. So he wanted cooperation, and uh, he didn't get it from the leaders very much, but he got it from others. So he was very, uh, he saw Krishna in that. Krishna is Krishna's helping him, sending others to, sending people to cooperate with him, to help him. When there are too many materialistic activities by the people in general all over the world, there is no wonder that a person or a nation attacks another person or nation on slight provocation. That is the rule of this age of kali or quarrel. The atmosphere is already polluted with corruption of all description, and everyone knows it well. There are so many unwanted literatures full of materialistic ideas of sense gratification. Now this is, I want to mention this, uh, back in the, in the old days when we were listening to cassette tapes and maybe later also, there was a lecture, Prabhupada gave a lecture on this verse, and it was called a Publishers or Printers Convention. I always wondered about it, what that was about. It doesn't say that anymore. If you look it up in the database, it just says lecture. But at the end, one of the devotees there, Hans of Duty, says, any questions? And then apparently there's silence and probably says, no questions. <laughs> And Hansa Dutta says, there's, you know, some prasadam or books in the back or something like that. So I always thought, when you hear this, what Prabhupada did at the, in that lecture was he had Prajumna read this whole purport. So he's speaking to publishers who are publishing the, all the garbage that <laughs> Prabhupada is talking about, which he'll talk about more here. So he's basically telling them everything that you're publishing is just garbage, your place of pilgrimage for crows. So maybe that's why they didn't have any questions at the end. <laughs> So he says, the people in general want to read, that is a natural instinct. But because their minds are polluted, they want such literatures. Oh, did I skip a line here? Oh yes, I think I skipped a little. There are many unwanted literatures full of materialistic ideas of sense gratification. In many countries there are bodies appointed by the state to direct and censor obscene literature. This means that neither the government nor the responsible leaders of the public want such literature, yet it is in the marketplace because the people want it for sense gratification. The people in general want to read, that is a natural instinct, but because their minds are polluted, they want such literatures. Under the circumstances, transcendental literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam will not only diminish the activities of the corrupt mind of the people in general, but also it will supply food for their hankering after reading some interesting literature. In the beginning they may not like it because one suffering from jaundice is reluctant to take sugar candy, but we should know that sugar candy is the only remedy for jaundice. We may be able to relate to that somewhat ourselves. Similarly, let there be systematic propaganda for popularizing reading of the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam which will act like sugar candy for the jaundice-like condition of sense gratification. When men have a taste for this literature, the other literatures, 
which are catering poison to society, will then automatically cease. This is really a paraphrase from a verse, a verse in the, uh, I guess it's also in the 12th canto. Tadrasamrita triptasya nanyatya syadriti kvachit. When one tastes the rasamrita of the Bhagavatam, then one loses the taste for all other literature. We are sure, therefore, that everyone in human society will welcome Srimad Bhagavatam, even though it is now presented with so many faults. For it is recommended by Sri Narada, who has very kindly appeared in this chapter. <laughs> I love the way this purport ends. So poetic. Narada Muni has very kindly has very kindly appeared in this chapter, gracing us with his his auspicious presence. So this it sounds like a speech, doesn't it? A rallying call. You can just picture someone rallying the troops. <laughs> so this is Tadbhag Visargo Janatagavit Plavo Yasmen Prati Shlokam Abadavatya Pi Namanya Nantashi Yashon Kitani Yat Shrinvanti Gayanti Grananti Sadhava. If there's anything else I want to mention. Actually, yeah, I did, I did have a thought in the beginning where the Bhagavatam, this, this whole idea that it, you can say it's, it may be, in a sense, uh, it's imperfect. It's Krishna. We know the Bhagavatam is Krishna. But Prabhupada is implying that there may be some imperfections in it. In the... In the or... or uh, Vyasadeva, is it Vyasadeva, or Narada Muni, there may be some imperfections in it, but that's okay. We should overlook those things because it's transcendental. So I was thinking how this is similarly like the Dham. The Dham is also completely pure, but what do we see? We see so, so much contamination. And also the deity, sometimes the deity may be, sometimes the deity is Krishna and the deity may have some imperfection in, in the carving or something like that. You know, sometimes the Hindus, they'll reject the deity if it has some, something wrong. But we, no, Prabhupada, accepted. in fact, I think uh, Radha London Ishwar had something. But Prabhupada didn't care. It's Krishna. It's Krishna because he was seen transcendentally, Satchirananda Vigraha, even though appearing in a material form. So the Bhagavatam, the Dham, the deity, they all may have, from our point of view, there may be some imperfection there, but they're perfect because, because they're all Krishna. So, any discussion on this? Ranga Vindabhu? I was to confirm with you that what I understood from your reading that uh, all the narrations in the other Vedas besides Bhagavatam, not necessarily glorification, even though it appears like pastimes or even some kind of a abstraction, like a, but then it, there is a specific definition of glorification uh, that given in Bhagavatam, which is not possible or available in other places. Am I right? Well, this is the way, th I, I was just reading Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says, taking this verse and the next verse, that means the 12th canto verse that I read. Taking these verses into consideration, the word vachaha, which Prabhupada translates here as statements. Uh, the word vacha should mean the general import of the discussion rather than each sentence. That being the case, so what do we know? What is the general import of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam? And it's the Paribhasha Sutra. So emphatically, that's, that's what it's all about. It's about Krishna. Uh, where did I see recently? It's sometimes the Bhagavatam is also called the Karshna Purana. So Karshna means in relationship to Krishna. So it's clearly about Krishna. That being the case, the chapters and stories of Bhagavatam are all ornaments to the glories of the Lord. In other Puranas, however, many stories are devoid of the glories of the Lord and are therefore the place of the crows. Thus there is no contradiction. So, apparently, in other Puranas, you don't really see Krishna there as much. Or, yeah, sometimes there are stories that are told that don't 
really seem to have any connection. But at least Vishnath, now I don't always see the connection with Krishna and the Bhagavatam, but Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur is saying, no, it is there. Actually, even these, all these genealogies in the ninth canto, what is it leading up? The last chapter of the ninth canto is when Krishna and Balaram appear. So we're hearing about their family going back so many generations, you can say. So that's one reason why it's there. And as it's unfolding, then sometimes Prichamaras will ask, well, that, that's an interesting what you just said briefly about this person. Can you tell me more about that? So he wants to hear more about one of Krishna's ancestors, you might say. So it's there. And I was mentioning in a previous class how the word Krishna also comes up in many verses where you would think that sometimes it would just be a, maybe the word would be Bhagavan or something like, you know, some generic word meaning God. But often, specifically it says, even it, even it says that that Prahlad Maharaj was seeing Krishna, it says there, and he talks about Krishna specifically. So it seems like that's also part of Vyasadeva's technique here, you can say his, his rhetoric, his way of presenting his, his message, is to insert Krishna throughout the book so you don't forget this is all about Krishna, even though sometimes it may not seem that it's not like that. So apparently what, what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is, is implying here is that you don't, it's harder to see that. It's harder to see Krishna necessarily in some of these stories that come up in the other Puranas. So it's more focused in that sense. More, it's more I'm obvious. To, I'm trying to understand. Like for an example in Vishnu Puran, the glory of Radharani is given much more than Bhagavatam. Mm. Even there is a verse, <clears throat> Saptam Saptam Puna Saptam Saptam Eva Puna Puna. Krishna himself speaking that this is the truth. Actually, this is the real truth. You must understand this truth. What is it? Bina Radha Prasadana Mat Prasadam Navichyata. Without Radharani's mercy, you will never get my mercy. But yet, question raised that none of the Ramanu's followers ever became Radharani's bhakta. But even the most secret, how many we have in Bhagavatam? It's only one. Anayara Dito Nunam Bhagavan Hari. That's the only verse like that. You can say maybe directly addressing Radharani. So my point, I'm trying to understand like where is the missing link? Because Joshua Murari like, or Vishnu Chukuti Thakur was saying that the glorification of Krishna not necessarily a pastime of Krishna. Well, it seems to support this idea, Vishwanath is saying, that the overall theme is what's important. So the overall theme of Vishnu Purana is Vishnu. Right? That's what it's all about, ultimately. It's about glorifying Vishnu. And there may be something about Radharani there, something about Krishna there. But they see it in a different way because they're being trained, you can say, to see Vishnu specifically. So when most 99% of the verses are glorifying Vishnu, then you think, well, that's what this book is about. So that's the message that's, that's getting through. Mother Mati? <clears throat> In the same light, what Prangavinda Prabhu is mentioning, I've been thinking from your initial um, part of your class about the Puranas. On one hand, yeah, there is so much glorification, but there's glorific the parts of the stories or some stories that don't glorify Krishna. But at the same time, we hear that, we see that uh, Rupa Goswami, there's so much like to, to establish points, uh, it seems like they, so much quote from the Puranas. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you know, Puranas are very, if yeah. you're quoting something to establish something, yeah. that means that must be a very important literature. And plus I've heard, I mean I haven't read any of them, just hearing from the classes here, that um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta mentions that more important now is the Puranas and the Mahabharata and Ramayana than the Upanishads and all the other literatures and the Vedic literatures. And so, so yeah, it's a little, it's a little um, I guess, confusing or, or, mm -hmm. or want to know more. What is, what is the uh, status of the Puran? Well, of course, what you're just saying, that's, that's what Jiva Goswami presented in the Tapas and Darva. He started with the Vedas and then he said, well, better than the Vedas are the, the Mahabharata, the Itihasas, and then better than the, those are the Puranas, and of the Puranas, the best Puranas are those in the mode of goodness, and then the, ultimately Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's a progression. 
they're higher. Now, of course, the, the um, even Jiva Goswami in making his points, he establishes Srimad Bhagavatam as his primary pramana. This is how I'm going to, you know, prove my points. I'm going to quote the Bhagavatam. What he does, most of the Anuchetas, they begin with a verse from the Bhagavatam. And then he speaks about that. And when and, and in establishing the legitimacy or the, the, the Siddhanta of that verse, he quotes from the Upanishads, the Puranas, in different places. So, again, it seems to be that it's a matter of focus, because the Bhagavatam is so focused on Krishna. And, of course, we have the whole tenth canto, which is 90 chapters about Krishna, specifically. So that seems to be what's being emphasized. I, I, th I see this principle often in... Um, in fact, this is sometimes, I think, a cause of confusion, even in Prabhupada's instructions, where it depends on what level you're on. Something is, you might say, it's perfect. It's perfect for you. You should do this. It's like Prabhupada gave different instructions to different people. But we find that we're doing something that this is the right thing to do. This is the level you should act on. But then when, you, when you're a little higher, then, well, that's not good. I, I can't go back, back down, you might say, back down to that, which that may be a good for one group of people, but that's not where I am. Like, we're very happy if somebody just would meet someone on the street and get them to chant the Maha Mantra. <laughs> if I only do that once a day or once a year, chant the Maha Mantra, that's not, nothing to get excited about. So there, there are these different levels. So that, that seems to be what's going on in, in, in Jiva Goswami. He's showing, of course, he gives other reasons why. So the, the Vedas, who can understand what, even what they're talking about most of the time? Because the times are so different. They, they, they'll say something and you'll say, what, what, what are they talking about? Because the, just like in the sacrifices, who knows exactly how these things work. So they were, they're irrelevant in some ways and they're so huge and there's so much, you know, there's stories and, and, and um, discussions that are just really not irrelevant. Are, even like, uh, like the Vishnu Purana, take that for an example. So in ISKCON, if somebody started really promoting Vishnu, we probably wouldn't be too happy about it. Huh? There is an ISKCON, a Prabhupada disciple who's really into Vishnu. And uh, so he does kind of goes his own way. You know? So it's okay, he's, he's Krishna conscious, at least he's Vishnu conscious. He's just attracted to that. But it, we wouldn't make it really a, you know, something that we would emphasize. There's even that purport in the Bhagavad Gita where Prabhupada says, one should worship the two-handed form of Sham Sundar and should not get distracted by worshiping other forms of Krishna. So that's the idea, is we're focused, we're Gaudiya Vaishnavas, Krishna and, and Lord Chaitanya, of course. So that, that's, that seems to be the idea, of course, there's much. Now, it, it seems in one way, you wonder, Narada Muni, why is he being so heavy about this? <laughs> the way he uses this heavy word, Yukupsitam, which is like despicable, condemned, horrible. It's a really hard word. And that's the way he, but it seems like he's just trying to get the point home, you might say, with a little hyperbole there, maybe, really making the point. Prabhupada was certainly, uh, happy to use hyperbole sometimes to get the point through. So I think that be the idea. Because as you're saying, it's not that the we don't touch the Vishnu Purana or these other Puranas, they're like forbidden for us. No, it's, it's not like that. But our emphasis, the emphasis on the, is on the Bhagavatam. And we, we can take some assistance from those other scriptures at the same time. Ragatmika Prabhu. In the verse, uh, the statement, imperfectly composed. Um, it seems that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you indicated that even before Prabhupada took up the task of translating and commentating the Bhagavatam, there was some Im example of imperfectly composed. Other literature. No, in the, just the Bhagavatam, even though it's presented, you know, imperfectly composed. Uh -huh. it, so I looked into, uh, through the purport again, and it seems Prabhupada only points to the example of himself. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there is no other example. Or, 
Or do the other yeah, commentators well, actually this verse, the, the verse itself isn't necessarily talking about the Bhagavatam. It's just saying that even if, even if what is written here has some mistakes in it, it it's perfect because it's glorifying Krishna. So, as far as I, I mean, I've read the Bhagavatam, I've read, you know, some commentaries. Now, there are places where Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, for example, will say, you know, this may appear to be incorrect grammar, but then he'll say, no, it's not. Jiva Goswami does the same kind of thing. Actually, there's something interesting in the beginning of the um, Bhagavat Sandarbha. He quotes from Vishnu Purana, actually, Jiva Goswami, establishing what Bhagavan is. We had the six, you know, the six offenses of Bhagavan, and he also breaks apart the word Bhagavan, and he explains how these, each one of these syllables, Bhagava, means something, which I, I can't remember which, what, they all, what they mean exactly. But then he says, you might think that in the Sanskrit, this should actually, because it, according to Sanskrit rules, it should be Bhagavava, Bhagavavan, Bhagavavan. The possessor of Bhagava would be Bhagavavan. But then he goes to the, in the Sanskrit, he says, no, then he quotes some rule. It's amazing how many rules there are. When you look closely at the Jiva Goswami, you know, there's a rule for this particular, I think it's Mattup, is it, Van? Do you know Madhavati? Uh, anyway, there's a technical, for this, this uh, ending, actually it came up in this today, in Vat, Abhadavati Api. So he explains why, according to when the Y is, is you know, if you, if you have a V and it's followed by this vowel and so on, then you could leave it out. And so he gives an explanation like that. So somebody might look at the Bhagavatam sometime and say, oh, this, this isn't grammatically correct. Now there's also, there's another principle, which I've mentioned it before. It's called Arsha Prayoga, or just Arsha. Arsha means in relationship to rishis. So the idea there is that sometimes there are mistakes, even in the Upanishads, grammatical mistakes. And it's called the, basically the prerogative of the rishis. If you're a rishi, you can make some grammatical mistakes. You don't have to be a big brainiac, academic type Sanskrit scholar. Maybe you can make a mistake, but that's okay because, well, you're a rishi, you're a transcendental, or you're a pure devotee. So that, that seems to apply here. If a pure devotee is, just like Prabhupada said, the person presenting these, the message of Krishna may not know how to write perfectly and so on, but what is coming from his heart is what we have to take. So that, that's... That's the idea too. So whether the Bhagavatam has any actual mistakes, I don't, because I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but apparently some people think there, there is sometimes, but our acharyas say, no, that's, that's not wrong. You should look at it this way, of course, which is what they would do. So on this particular verse, uh, there is no commentary by an acharya pointing an, to an example. Yeah, I, what I read was, you know, I read something from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur on this verse, and he doesn't say that it's necessarily about the Bhagavatam specifically. Pushkar Prabhu. Commentary. And I only got the first book, it's three chapters of the 10th piano, and then I guess the second part came out, and very technical by one of Gopi Pranadana's followers, mm -hmm. some guy named uh, Gora, Canadian guy. Use my pictures so I have to the later, so he gave me a book. But it's very technical, and he, he, in the beginning of the book, he's talking about every single commentary that Prabhupada used that, that exists. And he's funny because he'll say, BBT is wrong about this. And <laughs> she, it shouldn't say she Raju Vacha. It should just say Raju. All the other versions say Raju Vacha. They're wrong. You know, just, because he's originally this kind of guy and he loves Gopi Pranadana. But so there are some little things. Then he, there's one commentator named Dunda so and so who only commented on the ground. He didn't give any philosophical thing. And apparently many of the acharyas defer to him and say, okay, yeah, you know, he's a super grammarian. I can't remember if you came before Jiva, maybe after before, but they just said, okay, yeah. So that, just comments on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there's not, they don't mention too many discrepancies. There's just different readings, though. Many times you'll see in this version that that slightly better. Still, like Prabhupada will say, even if it says Bhava or uh, Bhutanam or Bhavanam, but the similar meaning is there. 
quite surprised you not to see that. But the grammar remains intact. Sita Devu. It was, it was interesting, um, you were reading the, I think it was Vishnu Chakravati's analysis, and he was talking about import. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so, you know, we're reading these literatures, Bhagavatam, is, is the authors and the speakers, and, you know, when you're writing a book, you have this vision, this intention that you invest in everything that you write, and that, that presentation to bring it to a certain point, and in the Bhagavatam, that description Bhakti, you know, they're, they're consciously weaving the whole narrative to get you there. Whereas it seems in some of these other piranhas, it's for different audiences to hope to get you there eventually through other means if possible. Mm -hmm. But the import is there, and thus, even if it's not saying Chan Hare Krishna right now, they are said it in the reverse. A couple of things about the Bhagavatam. One is that the Bhagavatam has words in it that you won't find anywhere else. I find this sometimes. I, when I go to online, there's, there's a site sanskritdictionary.com which I have to go through once in a while and it quotes from several different dictionaries Monier Williams, Professor Opti and a few other people and sometimes I'll look up a word and it's not there and Gopi Pranadambu, he, he said this, he says the Bhagavatam has some of its own language and um, another thing about the Bhagavatam, this in Tapasandar Bajiva Goswami says see if I get this right, he says the, the Upanishads speak to us like a superior, like our parents or you know, someone above us, the Upanishad. The Puranas speak to us like a friend. Oh, what, how did it go? Oh yeah, and the, what is it called? Kavya? Kavya, right? Is that the word for um, poetic literature? Yes, Kavya. Kavya. And the Kavya speaks to us like a lover. Yes. That, right? So that he, he says the, the Bhagavatam does all three of these. It speaks in all three of these different voices. Jiva Goswami, but I think this is a uh, kind of sort of like a common saying that the, you know, the, these different as parts of the Vedic literature speak to us in different ways. And he says the Bhagavatam does, speaks in all three ways. I just want to read a small one uh, paragraph of a letter Prabhupada wrote, 1969, letter to Raktaka, Hambar, 6, sep September 6. Regarding the two books you have mentioned, Sri Ramcharit Manas by Goswami Tulsidas is not very authorized and Ramayana is authorized. One thing is though, you have got enough other books to study. Did you appear in the examination held on Janmashtami day? I'm not sure about it. Why should you go to Ramayana Mahabharata when you have got Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, teachings of Lord Chaitanya? Don't divert your attention in that way. And then it goes on. So yeah. I was thinking like, I'm, I'm not saying the fanaticism, but it seems like, what is the good word of fanaticism? Like, like this line, they don't want us to like go anywhere until we understand the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Chaitanya. Don't go. That's what Prabhupada was reading himself. <laughs> Right? He was reading the books he had translated. He never translated those. All right, let's stop here. Shri Prabhupada. Yeah. Yeah.